being a business owner is is super rewarding, super lonely, super challenging, um, all those things. But every day I get to work on my passion, um, and that's always a reason to get out of bed in the morning and um, have the gift of doing something that I love. So Freshman Generation started seven years ago, um, and I am the co-founder and owner. Um, so I run a food business, so really like at some point there's just like a hum in the kitchen and people are listening to music and laughing and cooking, and so anytime that my team is in that place, it feels really good. Eating healthy, eating sustainably, eating delicious food is, you know, what what makes my world go round. Without our community, we have no customers. Without our community, we have no employees. Um, and so it is the drive for everything that we do that not only are we serving people, but people are satisfied with what we're doing and that we are being um, not just a business in a neighborhood, but a, a player that's contributing to better life for everyone. Ujima is, is, is really about us working collectively to achieve a common goal. And so I think that nothing gets done in isolation. And really, if um, we want to see better food options in our neighborhood, it takes um, our business, our employees, but also our customers um, to make that happen. My jersey up too high in the rafters. I got a frosty new knife and a tractor. Two sipping that moonshine and a plastic. Hey everyone, Joel Edwards here, sweating graciously here <laughs> in my house in Boston. Back with the Moonlighters Club, but today is special. We are working with the Ujima Project to conduct some interviews. Uh, welcome to Yours, Mine, and Ours. I am your host, Joel Edwards, and I have a special guest, Cassandra. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming to this stove of an attic that I have in my house. I'm so happy that you could join us. Super glad to represent you, Jima. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And also, Fresh Food Generation. Also, Fresh Food Generation. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk all about that. It's all, all, of, you, all of your chest. I like that. Yeah. Represent. <laughs> that, that was one of the first things I did when I started a business was get t-shirts made. And that was the proudest moment I've ever had in my life. That was all I accomplished. It, it is pretty cool to see people <laughs> wearing t-shirts. Yeah. yeah. with your business. Yeah. So, uh, let's get started. Where are you from? Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, moved around Boston um, my entire life, so. Nice, okay, nice. I went to, I think I've been to like three neighborhoods. It's funny, Boston's very small, but like, the neighborhoods matter, even though they're right next to Yeah, it's, it's very like a Boston thing to be like, no, that's Dorchester. <laughs> no, that's Roxbury. Right, so, you went to school here. Did you do the traditional high school, go to college, know exactly what I, what I want to do in college, and then start working in that field? Um, so went to school in Boston, went to high school in Dudley and always knew growing up in Roxbury that I wanted to do something that was going to contribute to making my neighborhood better. Mm -hmm. Right. My mom was a very giving person. She took care of like a lot of, of a lot of kids, even though I was technically her only child. So she always had that like mentality of you know, being in community with people and opening um, up, you know, her doors to people. But, so I always knew I wanted to help. I just didn't know what. Um, went to school, started doing some sociology stuff, decided that like, in order to be able to really help my community, people were always telling me like, um, you can't do something because that requires money. Um, so I decided to study economics <laughs> um, and have that as a background. So, yeah. And then eventually um, came back to Boston for urban planning. Okay. Um, and that was really what helped me like understand what I needed to be in a position to, um, you know, take care of the community that I grow up in and work in and live in and, you know, to, to some extent it's self-serving, I always say. 
What triggered you to want to help? That's interesting because a lot of people want to get want to get the hell up out of here. Want to get some money? Look, look, I'm not going back. What What was it? What do you think? Do you remember? No, I I actually had that um, mentality growing up. I was like, I'm gonna up until the age of like 14, 15. I was like, I'm gonna leave Roxbury. I'm never coming back. Um, and then I got a job at an organization called the Food Project. Okay. And they have urban farms and they have farms in the suburbs. And so I started working on a farm, started seeing like, wow, potatoes grow in the ground. <laughs> like, this is very cool. Um, and then I saw like vacant lots of my neighborhoods be transformed into, you know, urban productive farms that the food was going to homeless shelters, food was going to farmers markets. And I was like, this is dope. Like, you don't just necessarily have to leave there's things that you can do to make the community that you're in better. Um, I didn't expect at that point in time that I was gonna pursue a career in food or necessarily come back to Roxbury. I just saw my first example of urban planning, which was taking a vacant piece of land and transforming it into something that is productive for the community to use. Of course, at 14, I wasn't like, this is some cool urban planning. I was just like, this is, this is great. Nice. Um, but yeah, my life sort of circled back to that moment. All right, we've seen the foundation form. Yeah. Now, we're going to talk about fresh food generation, but before you get there, you're working somewhere. You're yeah. You're doing something professionally. Where were you working at, or what were you, what industry were you working? You don't have to get too specific when you were coming up with the yeah. idea. Yeah, so, so like another thing that was like really important in my, in my life was um, housing, right? My, my family is from Jamaica, came here. Housing was always an issue for us. I saw a lot of other people in my neighborhood struggle with housing. And so when I came back from urban planning, I was like, I'm going to go into the field of housing. So that's what I was doing for a couple of years. I was working in affordable housing after I graduated. And um, it's really messed up, our housing system, right? Like, And, and I learned that um, on a personal practical level being on the other side of trying to provide housing and um, the systems aren't really designed to support low-income individuals mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know if I wanted to partake in a system that was um, structurally flawed okay yeah got it so while you're doing this where does the trigger start going in your mind of yeah. being a business owner like what, 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 what starts to happen in your life where you're like, I think I can do something about it. So, um, you know, I had essentially moved back to Roxbury and that was intentional. A lot of people were like, why would you go back to Roxbury? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is where I'm from. Roxbury is a beautiful neighborhood, right? Like there's just so, there's just so much beauty in it. This is where I wanted to be. And um, I was working out at the Roxbury YMCA. I always tell this story. Came out, um, realized like there was nothing healthy for me to like, eat like after you work out you want you like want to put like something that's good in your body for all that hard work that you just put in and it was like cool I can hop into my car and I can go to to make a plane I can go to Cambridge you know all these other neighborhoods because I have a car and find something healthy to eat um but on this one block you know there's fried chicken there's pizza and then there's pizza and fried chicken um, and these little kids are going in and out of Popeyes, um, and clearly they have health, some health options. And it was just, it like, it didn't sit right with me, yeah. right? Like if I want to have kids and, um, I want them to be able to, um, walk down the street in their own neighborhood and get something healthy, right? Yeah. Nothing wrong with Popeyes. Like I eat it once in a while, but the problem becomes when it's your only option yeah um and at the same time i was having a couple of friends with um, family members who were dealing with um diet related deaths and amputations right yeah. like that's like that's how serious it can get for people and knowing that specifically Roxbury, dorchester and mattapan have the highest obesity and diabetes rates um and a lot of that is due to food options that are available. I know way too many people with diabetes. It's insane. Yeah, and, and, and we just like throw the word around lightly, but like 
when you see someone like lose a limb yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because of the food they're eating, like yeah. that's just crazy to me. Like no one deserves yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm a frequent chicken customer at that Popeyes. I don't even think that's a thing. You know I exactly which one. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know exactly which one I'm talking about. I've been okay. there quite, quite too many times. So yeah. people get super nervous around me sometimes because they're like, think I'm going to be the food police. Yeah. Um, that's not the case. I just think that, um, you know, if you're going to go to Popeyes and right, right around the corner from that Popeyes is the McDonald's. Yeah. Right? Yeah, hell yeah, that McDonald's. Yeah. 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 So, but like, what is your other option? Right. right like and I think we we go to places like Popeyes and McDonald's because um, to a certain extent the food tastes good right like they have millions of dollars that they spend um, making their food taste good so I gotta compete yeah right like yeah. that specific Popeyes when it first um, launched it was um, praised because it created jobs for the neighborhood right I think it was like something crazy, like 200 people applied for a job at Popeye's in one week. Um, and then the food is good. So I was like, I knew these things sort of going in. It was like, okay, so I got to create jobs. They got to be better paying than Popeye's. And um, the food has to be good, right? And so now we're going up against scientists because, you know, it's not real food, okay? <laughs> It's not. There's no way that the like fried chicken um, sandwich at McDonald's cost a dollar. Okay. Like as a food owner, you 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 know that, right? Yeah. So um, it's been a fun competition, and um, it's it's forced us to show up as our best if if we're gonna compete with something that has delicious tasting food like Popeyes. Yeah. So let's let's get in at like the beginning of that. You you were. We, and we alluded to this off camera, we're going to talk about the realness yeah. of being a business owner. So you're ready to get this started. How how do you juggle this while working? Like, what, What's that like? What are the first things you're doing while still working to kind of get this idea off the ground? So uh, first I needed experience. The only like food experience that I had outside of my kitchen was um, as a waitress. Okay. So front of house. Um, so I started working um, back of house at a restaurant in Westwood because that was like the only place who would take me with a lack of experience, right? And, and no culinary training. Um, so I did that for a while and then simultaneously my business partner got a job at Bon Me. So we launched with a food truck and, and we needed food truck experience. Yeah. Um, we did a Kickstarter and we were able to raise the funds for our food truck. Um, really challenging. I don't know if I have the, um, I don't know, like the older version of me has the bandwidth to ever do a Kickstarter again. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, but I was young and naive and ready <laughs> and... Um, we successfully did the Kickstarter, got the funds to buy the food truck, and um, from there it was it was really really hard, right? Like, I quit my job too early. Um, we we had the money for this like large vehicle, right? A, a food truck is like about fifty thousand dollars. We have the money for that, but like now you need money for um, to buy food. You need money for employees. You need money to ramp up because you're not going to start from the beginning and start out with like making a million dollars a year you're just not that's not going to happen um so it, it was just a series of bootstrapping and um making sure that when we did send product out it um tasted good enough for someone to come back and then like continuously getting better from there it's crazy you say you don't make a million dollars immediately because in the movies that's how it works. Like you quit, you dance, yeah, money. Yeah. It's like a montage. Exactly. So at what, what point did you realize you quit too early? Like when did it? When were you like, all right, this may not have been the best. Was it like right after you quit, or did you? Was it when you first started getting those expenses rolling in, and you were like, man, I maybe should have waited um, a little bit. I realized I quit too early when we started applying for loans for the business, right? Mm. So like for that like 
what they call working capital so that you can pay employees and you can pay yourself, right? Okay. So yeah. the, the first realization was, um, I'm not going to name the CDC, but it was a CDC, not a bank. <laughs> uh, we had to, they wanted to know what my income was okay. in order to get a loan. And I was just like, but I'm getting a loan because I don't have an income <laughs> so that I can run the business. And they were like, no, like you really need to be like, have some sort of personal income for us to feel comfortable with us loaning you some money or like you need collateral. And I was like, well, I don't own my own home. Mm. And they were like, well, can we use the food truck as collateral? And they were like, well, you got the food truck funds with the ki Kickstarter. So essentially, like, I didn't have collateral, I didn't have savings, I didn't have um, another job mm. to be able to say, like, this is my value. If we default, I can, can still, as a business, I can still pay this loan. That was, like, the first realization of, like, oh, like, you thought you were cute when you did the Kickstarter. Like, that was the easy part. Isn't that insane that... Like, all I hear about business loans, you know, like, my wife and I just bought a house because of my wife. And, she, you know, like, women just hold it down. So, if, if I was by myself, that's not happening. Yeah. But business loans and home loans are not easy to get. Yeah. Yet, when I went to college, I was like, yo, can I get, like, $200,000 to, right. like, I don't know, study pajamas? I'm like, yeah, here you go. <laughs> Here's your 200 grand. It doesn't make any sense. When like, you're, like, still, like, barely old enough to drink. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, no, the only people who will give you a ton of money. Everyone yeah. else is stingy. Yeah, exactly. So when did you see, did, did you ever get a loan? Or did, were you just like, all right, cool, no, bootstrap. Like, this is going to be hard, so we just got to gotta tighten up around it. We, we got a loan, um, and it was from the Boston Impact Initiative, and we were very fortunate that nice. we were, um, they had just launched. Okay. I don't think okay. that that would have been the case now. So they were still figuring out what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and we just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Okay, um, that, that, that works. That it, works. And it wasn't, um, the loan that we got wasn't sufficient, right? Like, when you, when you come from no money and when you start with no money, when you see a certain amount hit your um, bank account, you're like, whoa, this is, like, the most money that I've ever seen in my life. But, like, eventually, as a business owner, you start to see money in different numbers, right? Like at one point, 10,000 was a lot to me. At one point, 30,000 was a lot to me. It, and the numbers just keep on going up, right? And so now I look at that loan and I'm like, that was like two weeks worth of, mm. you know, <laughs> food and payroll and rent. And, but at the time it was such a big number to me. Yeah. 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 I like that. I like to see how that's the transition. Because you, then you really, it's funny, like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm definitely not fresh food generation level. That's my drink. Like, y'all killing it. It's all different, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, the numbers are different for yeah, different exactly. businesses and like, industries. Like, but, yeah. It, it's just crazy with the more bills I have, even though I'm making more, all I see it as this has to go to this thing. Yeah. And it always just increases while the other thing increases. Yeah. I never take a step back. I'm like, yo, I made it. <laughs> like, no, it's literally just, it just doesn't stop. It's a ladder, bro. It just keeps on going. So, all right. Can you define fresh food generation for someone who has no idea what it is? Yeah, so we are a farm-to-plate Caribbean American food business. Um, so what does that mean? We try as much as possible to source um, our food from local farms. So like we have partners like the Food Project, um, Urban Farming Institute. They nice. have land um, within the city. And um, we also have sort of regional partners that we can work with to get food delivered to us. Um, so as much as possible, we try to source from um, local farms. We definitely have menu items that are not local. So like we do the sweet plantains, everybody loves them. Obviously we don't have banana trees growing mm -hmm. in New England, not yet. Um, we have rice bowls. Um, we have options for omnivores, so meat lovers, vegans. Uh, so we have jerk chicken as an example, and uh, the jerk sauce is made with 
habaneros and scallions and onions that come from local farms in New England, but it's made into a traditional Jamaican sauce. Um, we have empanadas and we're able to like fill the empanadas with like different local veg um, or like grass-fed beef. So that that's our company product in a, in a nutshell. Um, but we do we do various different things with that product. So describe a normal day. Like what what is that like? Like I, I I like to cook, but I know I couldn't last in a restaurant. I just just from seeing what it looks like from the table in the back. Yeah. What is that really like? Uh, you know I I really like not sitting in front of a computer for the whole entire day. So. Um, I like the mix of physical activity um, and, you know, so like we, we have um, actually five different business lines and this is like part of um, being a company that has had to bootstrap mm -hmm. and figure out and it's the reason we survived the pa pandemic. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we, so at any point in time, if you were to walk into our kitchen, um, we have food going onto the food truck. We have food that's going out for catering. And so that's oftentimes to a community group, like Ujima has been one of our biggest supporters in terms of ordering catering. Um, we have home deliveries going out. So that just started with the pandemic where you can buy like a week's worth of food, put it in your fridge, heat and serve. Um, when the corporate catering market crashed, we had to figure out alternatives to survive. So one of the things that we did was shipping food nationally, which is kind of cool. So like we can like, um, if you have a grandma in California, you want to send her food, we can do that. And, um, one of the things that has been new, a completely new thing for us and happened as a direct result of the pandemic um, was grocery boxes. So we never quarantined. We got a call immediately from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation, um, like one week after everything sh shut down, saying that like there are people who have not received a check, who can't get through to um, unemployment and are hungry. Can you guys provide prepared meals and grocery boxes? So we have been providing grocery boxes for the past two years. Um, and uh, we've seen groups or organizations um, come up with different variations and programs. So one of the things that we're doing right now is these like medically tailored grocery boxes um, and then dropping it off at individuals' homes. And I never thought that that would become um, a core of what we do, but it has. And so that's that's literally what our day looks like. If you come into the kitchen, like you will see all those activities going on. Um, some of our team loves it, some of our team hates it, but we're around because we've been able to pivot and do these different things. That's awesome, that's awesome. Yeah. Now you've done a lot, um, mm -hmm. I'm already inspired. Do you still suffer, or have you suffered? Because I still suffer from <laughs> imposter syndrome. And for those of you who don't know, I've been working for years and there are days I wake up and go, some days these people are going to realize I don't know what I'm doing and they're going to fire me. And I have to coach myself up. Have you ever gone through that, even as a business owner? I, I still go through that. And I don't, like, I don't want to make it sound like um, we have everything figured out and it's like super easy and we're this like well-accomplished business because we're, we're not, right? It's still, it's still a constant struggle. I still make sacrifices that I really don't want to make sacrifices. Like I not being able to see my nieces and nephews because I'm working around the clock. Um, so like, yes, I definitely do have imposter syndrome. Um, I think one of the things that I have that has helped me recently is knowing that like I need to step up because I care about my team. Right. So like, what's the type of um, behavior or leadership that's going to allow my team to be able to get the wages and salaries they deserve? Um, and what's the type of behavior that's going to put me in the position where I'm not constantly working 
um, over time. And um, I actually had to have someone coach me. So it, it wasn't like something that I've been able to figure out on my own. But yeah, it, it definitely is imposter syndrome. And I think the world will tell you, based on how you look, like the nerve of you to ask for that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Like, who do you think you are? Um, and it's really just like working, working my way through that. I can give you an example if you... Oh, absolutely. I want this. Okay. So we are um, in the process of opening up a restaurant. And we're very blessed to be able to be in that position. Because uh, restaurants cost a lot of money to build, right? If you're putting in HVAC systems, it's not just a room. Um, and it's been a challenge getting the construction team to um, embody the vision of the project, okay. right? And um, in a way that I think if the project was happening downtown, it would be like, of course we're going to do yeah, this, yeah, yeah. right? And so it's um, definitely, I've, I've had to figure out how to show up in those construction meetings, which are weekly, to, you know, have them understand why this project is valuable, right? So we're opening up in Common Square, um, and we're opening up in a neighborhood um, that deserves nice things, right? Because we're, we're seven years in, we, we now have some of that, like, bandwidth to be able to build out an, uh, a space with um, perks. So it has like patio seating. Um, we're putting in a mural. We're putting in a plant wall. And these are things that like aren't as common in Dorchester, right? But if you go to Fenway, for example, if you go to Cambridge, you mm -hmm. see all these nice architectural features yeah. in restaurants. Our community deserves the same thing. So um, it's been arguing with the electricians, <laughs> or not arguing with them, um, helping, helping the contractors understand like why we need particular lighting for this space. Yeah. It's because we want the plants to survive. Why are the plants important? Because people deserve to have a space um, that, you know, they are excited to go to and sit down and eat. Um, and, and that's a little bit different. So having that, like, being able to communicate that and get over this fear of, like, well, who do you think you are? Like, why do you need these special things? So-and-so is operating on the street and they don't need those things. Yeah, that's that. I call that that's that rich white guy in a suit energy. Like whenever yeah. you go out downtown, there's a guy in a suit doing, saying crazy things it's and doing whatever. Right. You're like, all right, let me just try it. Just do it. Yeah, that's the thing. We're told not to, and you think that you look crazy by saying certain things, but you have just as much right to have an opinion as anyone yeah. else. So I think that's valid, I, and I'm, I'm glad. And I hope they get the lights right because you do need <laughs> plants. A restaurant without plants is just weird. Um, yeah. So one thing that stuck out to me is that working with Ujima, you have specific Ujima has principles, and I love the fact that the businesses that they work with. That it's not just about the bottom line. There are specific principles that benefit multiple groups of people. And I looked up yours, and from hiring, background checks, 401k, there's, a, there's so many I want to key in on. Um, one, how did you pick out these specific guidelines in terms of we're not going to hire like this? You know, we're going to match 401ks. How did you weave that into your, your employment agreements. You know, mo most people will just say, screw it, we're just going to hire people, they'll be happy to work here and go from there. Yeah. Well, how did you even come up with these, and then why is that important? Yeah, um, this goes back to, like, the Popeye story, partly, like, where I was, like, <laughs> we're, like, praising the Popeyes because they're creating jobs. Like, they, there has to be more than that. Um, but also, like, I'm from here. Um, my brother... Um, is someone who has been in and out of jail, right? And he every time he comes out, he has a hard time finding a job, right? That which contributes to him then getting reincarcerated. Um, and so it's it's just like 
treat people how you want to be treated. I want my brother to be able to go out and get a job and be treated fairly. And so um, we didn't want to quarry people or have that be a barrier to working with us. Mm -hmm. um, the 401ks, like, I want a 401k, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, it's just, it, it's a vehicle for people to even know what a 401k is and then be able to have the option and decision to do it. Cool. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Oh, did I cut you off? No, no. More? no I, I appreciate you doing that. I think it's important for companies to know how, how hard it can get for folks out here. So... Give me a milestone that you would like to accomplish for 2022. Is there one thing that sticks out that you like to say, hey, we got this done. 2022 was a good year. Oh, my God. That's such a hard question, especially since, like, pandemic world we're living literally day to day. Um, yeah, like maybe health insurance. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's something. That's something. Yeah. Uh, uh. And is there any advice that you can give to anyone who wants to be in your position or who is currently in your position? Um, it's it's never easy. I think sometimes you just like learn to work with the different challenges and like those challenges no longer become panic attacks or things that like keep you up late at night. You just know. You just sort of like okay, what's the challenge today? I'm going to welcome it. And um, that can allow you to actually enjoy your passion um, and what you're doing a little bit more if you're not so caught up in, I've got to solve this. Because there's always going to be something to solve. There's always going to be something that goes wrong. Um, it's just what it is. And you, you've got to learn how to love that part of it too. Cool. And where can people find you and our... Give a little shout out to your business. What can people do to support? Yeah, so the restaurant is opening at 185 Talbot Ave in Dorchester. It is right next to the Lee School. Um, so you can find us there. But like, um, also you can find us on Eugenia's website. They do a great job of supporting and promoting us. So. Nice. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank we you. Pleasure this. to meet you. Thank it you for having us. Too. Yeah, we're not imposters here. I like this. <laughs>